Oh, Vegas. With you on the phones. 0161 228 BBC Radio Manchester. Oh, yeah. So, what was all that about then? The frowning? Hey? <laughs> Ah, uh, well, I'll tell you, I heard it earlier, so I'm nicking this, but I think it's just a fantastic piece of information. If you if you weren't listening six minutes ago, then I'll tell you again. Just just do this. It, it doesn't matter, it won't hurt, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I think it's magical. Do this. Frown. That's it. I just want you to frown. You don't have to hold it, just go like that, frown. I mean, I'm doing it, but you don't know. Just frown like that. All right. Why? Well, I'll tell you, I heard this the other day, it's quite fantastic. When you frown, it is, it's good. When you frown, the muscles and the way you use the muscles is exactly the same muscle structure and muscle sequence of use as a hedgehog uses when it curls up. How fantastic is that? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not. You don't tune in to me for all that nice rubbish, do you? But how fantastic is that? Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. So when you frown, and, and one presumes unfrown, if there's such a phrase, when you frown or unfrown, you use similar muscles. Obviously, they're in your head and not down your spine, but you use similar muscles and in a similar what you might call use pattern, as a hedgehog does when it curls up into a ball, and indeed uncurls from a ball. I heard that this morning and I thought, that is fantastic. That is probably the best piece of information. The best. We say we learn something new every day, otherwise we're dead and ought to be, but that will be the best thing I'll learn. Well, it's certainly the best thing I've learned so far in October. Oh, the other thing I've learned is that Apple computers are not infallible. Mine's just fallen to bits and had to be taken to the clinic, rather like a recalcitrant child. I've tried banging it with a lump hammer, but that never did out. I've tried all sorts. Dear God. I was on the phone for an hour and a half with an Indian chappy whose name was Waji. What a great name. Anyway, I was on a... I, I was. I rang their, their line at some phenomenal... Expense. It was just an ordinary phone line. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't one of them premium jobbies. And I rang Waji, as his name turned out to be, and spent an hour and a half with him. And, and to be honest, when Waji had finished with it and with me, it was working fine. Switched it off last night, wouldn't come on this morning. <laughs> so so I've, had, I've had to take it, limp it to the Apple shop, where it'll be turned into a Cox's Orange Pippin and everyone will be happy. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Right, 0161 228 You can talk about anything. You don't have to talk about hedgehogs rolling up into a ball. In practice, probably as well if you don't. So you can do that. And you can talk about um, was and Bwand. Yeah. Uh, Ian's already sent me an email. I don't think it'll be the last one of the day. It's good to see Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand have been suspended from the BBC. That should give a clear message to all other similar types in the media. How dare they gang up on Andrew Sachs and then laugh it off in the name of edgy humour. I think that's where the big offence comes, isn't it? The big offence comes in it being a third party. If somebody rang me and left a message on my answer phone saying, Bezik, you're a mouthy git and I hate you. I think, frankly, I would have to let that run off, wouldn't I? I'd just have to say, well, that's it, that's... I'm in the business. It's my choice to be in the business. It's my choice to behave the way I do. I'll just have to live with it. And, and frankly, would. I'm not giving you my phone number, that's for sure. But, frankly, I would do that. But if somebody rang a relative of mine, my dad, my brother, my sister in Australia, or any of my aunts and uncles, and, and left a similar message, then that would be unfair, because they're not in the business. Incidentally, they'd probably agree with you, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. But, but that would be unjust, wouldn't it? it? It's nothing to do with them. And, and the same here, just because, just because Andrew Sachs is in the media... Uh, as an actor, and a very good one, and, and a very popular one. Doesn't mean he has to accept that 
about his granddaughter. Whatever the truth is about his granddaughter is utterly irrelevant, surely. I, I don't know. Anyway, the two have been suspended. What will happen next? Well, I've been suspended um, in the past, and what happens next is you come back with your tail between your legs and a very, very stern warning. Whether that will be enough or what that will happen to them, we won't find out until the so-called inquiry has been gone through. But there are now over 18,000 complainants. 18,000. I'd put money on the fact that they've not all heard it. This is the North West's biggest sports station. This is BBC Radio Manchester. Last time City went to Middlesbrough was Sven's last game in charge. There's another chance for Middlesbrough to get another one. The Mark Hughes will be hoping for better tonight with commentary from the Rose side plus coverage of United versus West Ham, Bolton against Everton and Wigan at Fulham. The all-new Manchester Sports. Tonight from 7, BBC Radio Manchester. OK, it's up to you. You can talk about anything. I don't care what it is. Well, I do care, but it's not my decision. It's not up to me. You can talk about anything at all. Um... And it's up to you. So 01612822255, Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk, text number 07862069511. Have your say. Get it off your chest on this bitterly cold morning. Laura in Fallowfield. Hiya, Laura. Hello, Alan. Um, thanks for taking the call. I, I frowned when I heard that um, Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand had been suspended. I think it's wrong. I think it's terrible what the BBC are doing over this. I also I I, I listened to a program this morning and Max Clifford was, was on it representing the granddaughter and I thought, well if she's out and why go to Max Clifford? Why not go to a lawyer or the police or somebody like that, you know? Because Max Clifford milks it for publicity and uh, money and uh, it's just it's just it's a witch hunt now against you know the, as far as I'm concerned the villains the villains have become the victims I've listened I, to um, I'm a bit confused now you right. seem to, you I mean what I've understood you to say and I, I'll happily accept your correction what I've understood you to say is that Brandon Ross shouldn't have been suspended no that's or, not what you meant or no they shouldn't have been suspended they should not have been what, no. what should happen then there should have been an apology, and there's been other people have suggested maybe give half their weekly, monthly salary to children in need or something, and that's the end of it, you know? It's just everybody's jumping on it. Politicians, they never miss a trick, so they're jumping on the bandwagon. Max Clifford is involved. Um, well, there was, a, there was a lovely piece on, on Channel 4 News last evening. I didn't see it. Somebody told me about it. And, and the presenter pointed out that the Prime Minister has made no comment about the war in Doge, uh, Georgia, has made no comment about starvation in Darfur, but he had time in his life to comment on the Jonathan Ross, <laughs> Russell exactly. Brand situation. Yeah, you, exactly, you, wonder, you, know. you wonder about the Prime Minister. But somebody probably asked him, and I guess once you're asked... You, you're in the position of having to reply, aren't you, really? Yeah, and I'm sure question tends is on at the minute. I'm not, I'm not listening to it, obviously, but I'm sure there's MPs asking questions, oh, just to, just to get on, on their high horses about it, you know. There's a lot of sanctimonious hypocrites, and they're just taking... And I think you said it, that um, initially it was just two people. Indeed, just two and complained, then, and, and now, the, and now the newspapers it's... newspapers got hold mm. of it. Who, who told the newspapers was one of their editors listening to the show and said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll kick mm. this off? Or was it the people concerned? And, I mean, the actor, Manuel, I, I shouldn't be disrespectful to him, but I think he, this could be a kickstart to his career again, you know? He could be um, <laughs> I'm a celebrity getting me out of here. <laughs> and a lot what, of a, what an interesting thought. I, I don't think his career was in the doldrums, but, he, but you know, there's no such thing as yeah. bad publicity, they tell us. All right, Laura, thank you very much indeed. Laura says that they, Ross and Brand should not have been suspended. It's a, I don't think she used that phrase, a storm in a teacup. What do you say? You can talk about anything. You don't have to talk about them. Alex in Berry. Hiya, Alex. Good afternoon, Alan. It is. What can we do I, for you? I feel the previous caller has stolen my thunder, so I might as well just hang up now. No, don't do that. It's um, too embarrassing by far. 
I mean, at the end of the day, and um, you know, I'm not prone to hyperbole, hyperbole, but I'm I'm outraged by the decision by uh, the Director General Mark Thompson of the BBC uh, to suspend um, Ross and Brand. Why? Well, let me, let me just put this into some kind of perspective, if I may. And again, I'm repeating a lot of the talking points okay. that the previous I'm, caller just made. Don't worry, I want to hear your view. Yes, on the original um, broadcast on the 18th of October, two people complained at the time. And, you know, OK, that was that. And then there's, a, there's been about a week, a week and a half uh, delay. The Mail on Sunday and the Daily Mail has um, publicised this broadcast. And all of a sudden, we're at 18,000 complaints to the BBC and counting. Now, as I said yesterday, I don't condone the, the actions of Russell Brand or Jonathan Ross. Um, you know, whether you think it is funny or not, insult was, was caused, hurt was caused. And in my view, there are only two people who are justified in, in complaining, and that's Andrew Sachs and his daughter, uh, sorry, granddaughter, uh, Georgina Bailey. Um, so that's my view. And, and, you know, look what's happened since. As, as you quite correctly mentioned um, on Channel 4 News yesterday, with everything that's going on in the world, in, you know, foreign policy, what's happening in the Congo, and um, Gordon Brown and David Cameron see fit to, to comment on, on this incident. I mean, I, I ask a rhetorical question, has the world gone mad? You know, really, has the world gone mad? Are people so energised by, basically, you know, two men who phoned an actor who starred in a 1970s sitcom and, a, and, who, and you know, who, who left uh, messages on his answering machine about a sexual act involving his granddaughter? And people are energised to, to, to phone in or write in and make complaints about this. And let me just give you three examples, um, if I may, Alan, and then I'll quickly move on. Yeah. Last week, the, 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 um, the law lords in the House of Lords made a decision that the um, islanders of Diego Garcia in the Chagos Islands in the Indian Ocean do not have the right to return to their homeland. Correct. Are people not energised about that? Yeah. There, are peop there are young people... It, it will still are... be used by the Americans in air base. And Absolutely. Yet, and yet we have dominion over it. But go on. And there, are, and, and there are young people, children, who are dying at the hands of their parents and mm -hmm. step-parents through neglect. Are people not energised to complain about that? And I know you have a lot of um, senior citizens who listen to this radio programme, and there are going to be a lot of pensioners who are going to be in what they call fuel poverty, wondering how they're going to pay their fuel bills this winter. And are people not energised about that? OK, well, yeah, people are getting mad about All right, these that's, two comedians. That's three examples, but whatever else is going on in the world, and whether it's the province of Gordon Brown or not, I've no idea. If you're asked a question as Prime Minister, I guess you're put in the position of either saying we don't comment on that or commenting. You, uh, ignoring all of that, we have to look at what they did, and, and everything you've said is true. And that is, yes, they rang an actor, a well-known actor who's used to the public eye and therefore has to be prepared to accept some brickbacks, but they rang a grandfather about his granddaughter. Now, surely... If, if you want to ring Andrew Sachs as, a, as a, a, an entertainer or somebody else and, and say the only thing you ever did was Manuel and you were crap at that, if you want to do that, then he's got to live with that because he's, he's put himself in the public eye. If you want to ring the girl, Georgina, and say to her, you're whatever you think she is, fine, almost. But ringing one person about another, is that acceptable? I'm not condoning that. I do not condone that whatsoever, and that's to be condemned. And, and at the end of the day, as I said, there are two people who've been, um, as I said, hurt or, or maligned or whatever phrase you want to use. And from what I understand, um, apologies have been sent out to well, Andrew's let, let me Let me try one more tack then. OK. I do accept what you say, that the two people, the only two people who have been personally hurt by this are the recipient and the person to whom we were referring, possibly her parents as well. Yeah, okay. They're the only person with direct injury. But if I'm on a bus and a man gets up, walks over to a woman and spits in her face, I'm injured by that. I'm injured by that. I don't receive the spit, but I'm a witness to it. I'm injured by that. If I hear somebody using abusive language against somebody for their race, their gender, their physical ability, or just because they've got ginger air, I'm hurt by that because I'm a witness to something horrible. They did this not in the privacy of their own homes, where it would still have been an ingracious act, but they did this for all the world to see and witness. 
two uh, points. Have, have those people not the right to say, well, now I know about it, I'm hurt? Well, if I can respond to you in this way, please, and, and please point. yesterday you said, we spoke about this, that, you know, you can't stop people from being hurt. Somebody's going to get hurt or offended by whatever. You can't avoid that. That's the first thing. The second thing, and again, I'm not saying it's taste. It's tasteful or good comedy. I'm not saying that. But, again, this was done late on a late-night radio show for the fans of Russell Brand and I presume Jonathan Ross. That demographic uh, know what they're buying into. Now, as I said, the people who actually heard the commentary, two complaints. I, and I, su I said this yesterday. I suspect the majority of the 18,000 people who complained to the BBC are not fans or are not the demographic, the target audience of Ross and of Ross and Brand. So now I'm not saying that they haven't got the right to be offended and the right to complain. I'm just saying, should we be taking their their hurt feelings into consideration when when um, you know the the, the um, people at the BBC made their decision to suspend? Now m my final comment on Mark Thompson, I think he's shown himself to be spineless and to jump on the bandwagon. For me, what would have been suffice? Um, um, apologies to the people who, who, who have been mentioned, a, rep, a public reprimand or a public apology on the, on the airwaves, and that would have been the end of it. Right. I mean, Thompson has shown himself to be spineless, and at the end of the day, he is a politician, so well, what do you suspect? Well, he's not a politician, and perhaps he was just leaving it to his underlings, the people who have responsibility for that to deal with, but now it's not gone away, he has to take control. Anyway, that's your view, you're entitled to it, and we enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you, you Alex. Very much. Have a good day. Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. sorry. I just got a text from an anonymous text saying, I haven't heard it either, Alan, but I'm in favour of suspending Russell Brand on a rope. Very good. It's just gone 20 past 12 on BBC Radio Manchester. Richard Stead's got the headlines. Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross have been suspended from broadcasting on the BBC. A final decision won't be made until an investigation's completed into the obscene phone calls made to the actor Andrew Sachs. A driver who knocked down and killed a woman in Bolton nearly three years ago has finally been jailed for six and a half years and a shotgun's been fired at a pub in Salford. The Welcome Inn in Altsall was attacked last night but no one was injured. Manchester's weather dry and cold with a chance of snow in Pennine areas, highs of 7 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Traffic starting to back up on the anti-clockwise side of the M60 uh, at Junction 9. The camera's there showing that uh, it's getting really quite slow uh, towards the uh, exit slip road at Junction 9. Elsewhere, the motorway network seems to be doing quite nicely around Manchester. Stop lane at Weast, still uh, a, a lane closed due to the resurfacing work between Eccles Old Road and Meadowgate Road. And London Road at Macclesfield has some temporary lights between Moss Lane and Star Lane, so do expect a hold of a traffic in that area as a result. The Metro Link still has some short delays between Bury and Altrincham. It all follows uh, a tram getting uh, broken down earlier on this morning. If you spot any other problems, call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm David Powell. Decongesting Manchester, one car at a time. 2020 traffic. Robin Eccles says, I'm sure that the majority of complainants uh, are, are just jumping on the bandwagon because they don't like Jonathan Ross or Russell Brand and the amount of money that they get paid. Let them get a life. So says Robin Eccles. People complaining about Brand and, and Ross ought to, in the words of Rob in Eccles, get a life. I suppose you could say if 18,000 people... Now we're no longer relying on the people who listened to the programme or heard the programme. We're not relying on them for for the measure of whether it was tasteful or not. It certainly wasn't. But now we're saying 18,000 have complained, many of whom have never heard it. We're now looking at the whole population. 18,000 out of 55 million, hardly anyone's mentioned it. Phil in Swinton. Are you, Phil? Hello, Alan. Um, just, just, I've not learned the whole programme, just listening to parts of it. Um, mm. I just really wanted to make the point that surely all of this is mostly the responsibility because it was a pre-recorded programme of the people that actually put the program out, knowing its content. I mean, why have censorship if it's not applied? Um, I'd, I'd, re I'd extract the word most, because the producers didn't do it. It was done by the two individuals. Um, yep. But, yeah, the producers are the ones, and I don't know what, what level within the structure of the BBC the decision was made, but someone with the job to decide... Yeah. decided it was acceptable. I don't like the word censorship either. It's it's about it's about matching the programme to the audience. 
yes, but as a, as a sort of similar situation, I could write, say, uh, some I've seen a book with obscene comments or derogatory comments about a personality or a public figure. Um, anybody could do that, but it would only become offensive once it was published or, or actually put into the public domain. Yes. Now, until somebody takes that decision to do that, then it's not a problem. So whoever made the decision to put that, to air that program with that content is more responsible than Jonathan Ross. And, well, uh, there's, the cer band. there's certainly the people that, uh, our phrase, I'm sorry to use jargon, but they're the, certainly the people that allowed it to go to air. And yeah. I suspect the, the inquiry that's taking place is, is working out where that decision was made. It, it's perfectly possible there are quite a lot of people in BBC Radio 2 hiding under the tables at the moment. Well, well exactly, Locking yeah. themselves in the broom cupboard. What, what, what I'm saying though, is if, if heads roll, then you think it would be the people, those people that should be responsible or equally as responsible, should we say? I, I, yes. I mean, there, there is a tradition in the game, and I don't just mean at the BBC. It applies in all the electronic media, having served in most parts of it at some point. Yeah. There is a tradition of sacking the producer so that yeah. you don't lose the presenter. And frankly, I think that tradition is reprehensible, but it's slightly different here in that it wasn't live, as you say. And yeah. someone decided, someone if you like, someone with responsibility decided that that was acceptable. Yeah. I mean, in other words, why, why have those fail states in place and then, when they're not applied correctly, blame the presenters? Well, the, let's wait and see what the inquiry says. I, I don't think the BBC has decided to blame the presenters. I think the BBC have decided that whether rightly or wrongly, we'll have to, to find out later, but it would be invidious with the furore that's going on presently, it would be invidious if either of those two presenters appeared on the media, because allowing them to appear on the media would be a statement by the BBC louder than the one of not allowing them. Yeah, I, and I, I, I can tell you that contractually they'll almost certainly be paid whilst they're off suspended, because that would sure. be the deal. But it may well be that they may not have a job at the end of it. That's another story. But you, you couldn't. You, I mean, the... the Imagine the guests who are going to go on the Jonathan... I've, I've no idea who he's got booked for Friday, but imagine the guests who are going to go on that programme. They might just sit there and say to him, well, you take the mickey out of people all the time. We're now going to take the mickey out of you. And that's yeah. not what the programme's about. So, so there are all sorts of reasons why you would take them out of the firing line, off air, until decisions are made. So the suspension isn't a punishment. It, it's an aversion of further controversy, if you like. No, but I think, I think the public perception of it will be a slap in the face of Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand, won't it? I think it will, yes. I've sat, and I, and I, I've I, sat I, there and I suspect they will too, frankly. And I, and I, I, I just think that's wrong while a faceless um, administrator, or whatever he may be, sits back and possibly, as you say, well, without knowing the outcome, doesn't actually get... Well, there, there, there are a number of differences here, um, and I don't know this to be the case, but I suspect that the producer who made the decision... Um, may well not be actually producing at the moment. Go, yeah, on, go, on, go home and have a cup of tea, and we'll I mean, bring you this side, over. So you, I don't know, but I, I suspect that's the case. Sorry, Alan, just, just quickly, the other side of it, I, I did pick up on, your, I think, your last caller, who said that, you know, um, that, that the actual people that listen to this kind of programme, it won't be the people that are complaining, and, and she rightly said the majority of them probably haven't even heard it, because it's not been, hmm. public, public, you know, been out in the public domain since. Um, but having said that, I think everybody who watches Jonathan Ross' show on a Friday night, knows that, certainly of late, I've noticed and commented on the fact that he's not only getting near the knuckle he, or near the line, he's, he's passing it. And sometimes he, he, he does border on being um, going too far. But people know him for that, and that's his style. And if, you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer that if you don't want to hear it, turn it off. Indeed so. I, I made a programme for BBC Radio 4, it must be about two years ago now, yeah. Uh, I can't even remember the title of it. Oh, if, you, if you're easily offended, it was called. And it was a programme about the offensive comedians. Bernard was yeah. involved, yeah. as was Roy Chubby Brown. I had to go and see Roy Chubby Brown, and I was the only person that left early. Because they'd, they'd all paid good money to see him. He was utterly filthy. Uh, yeah. I mean, utterly disgusting. I hated it. For the but sake was, of it, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but that's his job. That's what he does, and he's, he's proud of that. And apparently the man himself, rather like Bernard, uh, I mean Bernard Manning, of course, yeah. uh, but uh, rather like Bernard, was a delightful fellow away from all of that. But that's oh, neither here nor there. But the BBC, on BBC Radio 4, a programme about offensive comedians made us beep the F word.
yeah. when we were playing clips. They said, yeah. no, we're not letting that go out because people, although they're tuning in to hear about the, the documentary about them, they're not tuning in here to hear the material. So there is a process. I still have arguments with the producer about that. I think it should have gone out. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the F word's prominent on telly on virtually every programme at almost well, every I, hour I, now. I think it's compulsory now if you're a kook. Absolutely, yeah. yeah exactly. A kook, a kook who for years has been on the telly and never said a word out of, never said boo to a goose, has just been yeah. to Rotherham. Obviously, as a as a now rich, a rich chef, he thinks if you go to the working class town of Rotherham, you have to say the F word because we all know the working classes are thick and stupid and can't speak. Okay. So he went there. And He's effing all over the place. Well, give, give them what they want. I mean, give them what they want. That. Well, they didn't want it. They don't want some mock cockney or mockney, as they call <laughs> who can't cook anyway and just made a good reputation. We don't want him sliming about the place with his stupid accent. But that's just oh, a personal totally agree view. With you. No, you're right. I agree with you. <laughs> Let's slag him off. Let's ring his answer phone. <laughs> Good on you, David. Uh, you're right. Phil. I'm going to talk to I David. Am. Good on you, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. David in Hazel Grove. I jumped the gun a little. David, how are you? Morning, Alan. Yeah, just. Uh, ringing up about Jonathan Ross and uh, the other fella. Go on. I mean, uh, Russell Brand, I, I, I find myself in, in awkward position defending him, but Russell Brand have got no time for whatsoever. But I think the BBC have gone mad to, to, to suspend him. To suspend him. I think it's a stupid thing to do. You know, it's humour. It, it went wrong, and it's as simple as that. You know, sometimes you tell a joke, and it's not funny. You know, and they did, they did, a, they did what he did wasn't funny. And it's as simple as that. I mean, but all this palaver over it, it's just, it's just, it's just overkill. But is not the is not the fly in the ointment of that argument that it wasn't just a joke; it was a prank, and it yeah. was. A, but it wasn't just a prank. It was. It. I can't see in the event when you ring somebody up and say, "I've had sex with your granddaughter." I can't see how that is meant to do anything other than hurt and we can laugh at your pain it's pulling the wings off flies isn't it well yeah i suppose yeah yeah i, 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 I must hold my hands up uh, i would actually hear the broadcast so but that said um I, the humor is cruel you know someone falls down the stairs and cuts a leg open and someone will laugh at it you know because they think it's funny you know that's humor is cruel you okay, know, and... let me let me try something on you let me try right. something on you um, I'm not. Well, I, I was going to tell you a personal story, but I won't because it's not fair on the people involved. But imagine the situation that you happen to see an accident in the street. You see two cars hit one another, and one of the people in one of the cars dies, and yeah. you and you find his driving license, and you know his phone number. So you ring his home and say, "Hey, hey, your Jimmy's just been killed." Yeah, that was not funny. That's yeah. a, it's still a joke. Yeah, but well, not funny. It's not funny, but no. but your defence, and I'm not I'm not shouting at you, but your yeah. defence uh, of uh, meagre though it is, uh, of and uncomfortable though it is for both of us, your defence uh, of, of Ross and Brand is that okay, the joke didn't work. That's right. Well, what they should have done, I mean, like the people said before me, you know, they should have held around and said, yeah, we're sorry, it wasn't funny, but, you know, it, it shouldn't have been said, shouldn't have been broadcast. And I think that would have been in the end to it. I mean, Jonathan Ross, I mean, someone was just saying about Jonathan Ross going over the line. I'd rather have someone interviewing someone who actually asked him a question that made him uncomfortable. That wasn't a comfortable, you know, what colour socks do you wear and what do you have for your breakfast? You know, if you want to listen to me like Parkinson, it was like, excuse me, I'm going to ask you a question. You know, you want mm. someone who's going to ask questions that have, have got some relevance and that are interesting. All right, you, don't well, want, like, you don't want stupid questions being asked, do you? We can all agree that he's good at his job. We'll all have to find out what the BBC thinks of this little bit of well, his I, job. I think if, I think if, they, if they sack him, I th well, I mean, Russell Brand, I mean, you could put him in a sack and throw him in the... In the, in the <laughs> can, me, but, but, can I provide the bricks? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I don't find I, I, I find him totally, un but that's me. But I know that loads of people find him funny. Well, I, I tell I, you, I my don't. my twenty two, twenty one year old niece is in love with him. Well, there you go. She thinks he's wonderful, absolutely and, 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 wonderful. And, I think she's barmy. But a bit of people who are rude and defensive, they should come and listen to you. Steady you know, now, like... steady now, otherwise <laughs> you'll be getting a slap. Good on you, David. Have a good All day, right, mate. mate. Cheers. 0161 228 I never heard it.
But can I be outraged by it? Many have said. Well, yes, they can. Ian in Stockport typifies. We don't need to have heard the Jonathan Ross Russell brand attack on Andrew Sachs in order to be outraged by it. And then he quotes a rather dramatic quotation, but nonetheless relevant for that. I wasn't in New York when the Twin Towers were attacked by maniacs. But I was upset for the people affected. It's called empathy. OK. I understand. 0161 228 How say you today? You don't have to talk about Ross and Brand, but a lot of people are, because the story's moved on. The Director-General, as you'll hear repeated in the news, no doubt, the Director-General of the BBC has suspended the two people from broadcasting for the BBC whilst an inquiry has taken place. Bill in Reuton, I have taken the trouble to listen to Ross and Brand and the messages they were leaving on Mr Sachs's telephone. I've listened to you, the YouTube link and to a link provided by a national newspaper. Frankly, I thought I was listening to a couple of overgrown kids. To think that they were being paid huge sums of licence payers' money to carry on like that defies explanation. Also, I've heard that the whole episode is only one form of humour. Well, I for one cannot recognise what went on as humour. Just two silly boys ranting over the airwaves. Again, I've heard the argument that such brands of humour are acceptable. Well, they are not. Not over the airwaves. If one wants to hear this sort of humour, people can, I'm sure, pay for tickets to go to venues where such events take place. It's then their choice. But no, not on the radio, to a general audience. This kind of so-called humour is very near the bottom of the barrel, as far as I'm concerned, and I think the BBC should maintain a much higher level of behaviour. They used to, he says. This will be the BBC that brought you till death or stew part, will it? And um, I'm sure quite a few Nazi Nazis had a good laugh at the Jews they were exterminating in the gas ovens, but that doesn't mean that the sense of humour should be accepted by the rest of society. Bill, thank you very much indeed. How say you? 01612282255. Kathleen in Failsworth. Hi, Kathleen. Hello. Uh, that chap who you've just read out yes. has just said exactly what I wanted to say. Well, you say it anyway. Well, I was disgusted with what happened, and I thought it was very bad. Uh, they are both foul-mouthed people to start off with, and I, I hope they do get the sack, because it's just not acceptable now, especially over the airways as well. It's bad enough when you hear it in the street, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, when they go for interviews, unless they can say the four-letter word on TV now, they just don't get on. I do nothing but switch programmes mm. off the, because of the four-letter word being used when no need for it to be used. Well, I mean, you can argue that there's never a need for it to be used, but the truth is that yes. these two individuals are very popular with the audience at which they are pointed. And it, it's a bit like... It, it's a very poor example, this, Kathleen, but when yes. football comes on the telly, I switch it off. But that's not an argument to ban football because there are thousands, millions, who switch it on because of the football. And I'm afraid it's the same with these two. Many people would turn it off. But that's fine. The BBC offers you a whole string of other places to get your entertainment. Yes. So they, they are loved and, and enjoyed by the people they're aimed at. Yeah. I just think that the morals have gone so down now that you know it's just not our world the older peoples mm. and uh, i just get upset that sa standards have gone so bad but yeah. let me let me offer you another thought and i'm not trying to yeah. convert you to to a different way of thinking yeah. but but there are programs there and whole networks for you yes. to enjoy you don't have to hear this I, su oh, no, I, I suspect you've not heard it, have you? No. So, no, I so, don't like it. Well, I don't blame you, but... It's not in my home, and I don't want it brought into my home. But yeah. but do you not accept that the, the BBC is entitled to say, well, OK, those are programmes that are suitable for Kathleen and, and yeah. others of her ilk, and there are many of them, and these programmes over here are not for Kathleen. In fact, they're for people who would doze off during programmes that were sending to Kathleen, but frankly, they're entitled to a programme too. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, yeah, I do agree with that. Yeah. All right. Well, then, then, <laughs> it's been good to talk. Yeah, a little bit okay. of a, a little of agreement's no bad thing, even when we're together. No. Good no, on you, Kathleen. Have a good okay, day. Okay. Bye. Kathleen says that sort of thing, she would turn it off, and a little bit of a thinks it ought not to exist at all. There is, and I quote, no need for it. Well, maybe two. Uh, Robin Eccles, Alan, why has it taken nearly two weeks for it to come out? If so many people are offended, well, we're back to what Ian said. You can, you can be offended. Even without hearing it, the very fact that it happened can offend you. You don't have to hear it to know. And, and somebody gave an example of the Nazi concentration camps. I wasn't there, but, you know, they still make me cross. I wasn't at the Twin Towers. It still makes me cross. There are thousands of kids starving to death in various parts of the world. It makes me cross. I'm not even hungry. It's just gone 20 to 1 on BBC Radio Manchester. Richard Stead has the news headlines. The BBC have suspended Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross over the obscene phone calls made to the Fulton Towers actor Andrew Sachs. Director General Mark Thompson has described the item as completely unacceptable. A driver who knocked down and killed a woman in Bolton nearly three years ago has finally been jailed for six and a half years and Lufthansa is to take control of BMI, one of the largest airlines at Manchester Airport. They're expected to complete the deal early next year. Manchester's weather dry and cold with a chance of snow in Pennine areas Highs of 7 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. Bottom Bridge on the clockwise M60 now down to one lane. After an accident, there's been a fuel spillage, and as a result of that, uh, some very slow traffic uh, backing up uh, beyond Junction 9, back almost towards Junction 8 now on the cameras. Uh, the tanker involved in the accident, having leaked diesel onto the carriageway, maybe a while before that can be cleared. Elsewhere, those things doing nicely. No problems on the M602 heading in towards the city centre. Looking good on the uh, M62 as well around the uh, Croft interchange. And uh, just some slight to watch out for on the Metro Link following uh, a breakdown earlier on between Bury and Altrincham, still one or two minor delays, and uh, still at uh, Piccadilly Gardens and Piccadilly, the stations uh, closed due to engineering works. Uh, so do watch out for the uh, shuttle buses that are uh, taking place of those services. If you spot any other problems, call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm David Powell. BBC Radio Manchester, sports with Delith Lawnett. Good afternoon. Darren Fletcher has admitted he is embarrassed at the high praise heaped on him by Manchester United manager Sir Alex Ferguson. Ferguson claims his biggest bit of business this summer was persuading the Scotland midfielder to stay at Old Trafford. Slightly embarrassed at um, the same thing with Harry Berbatov and what I've seen from him, he seems like a good sign. And with Cristiano Ronaldo still here. Um, obviously, I didn't feature as much of the light last year, but the manager reassured me that uh, there would be opportunities for me here, and I was wa I was wanted, and and that's all I wanted to hear, and uh, that's why I decided to sign the contract. But I know, unfortunate because it's been to the undoing of other people that I've had to run the team. United, meanwhile, entertain West Ham tonight in the Premier League. Oldham manager John Sheridan has called for more consistency from striker Lewis Alessandra. The 19-year-old scored a hat-trick for the Latics in their 3-0 win over Scunthorpe last night. The win moved Oldham up to fourth in League One. I thought his all-round game, him, him and Yuzi, who could have easily scored two or three himself, so I thought the strikers were, were very good tonight. I mean, he's a young lad, he frustrates me at times, but I, I've seen him on his, on his day. He does things what Premiership players do so uh, he's got to get it more in his game and he's got to be more consistent in his game. Mark Hughes has praised the current form of youngster Daniel Sturridge. Sturridge played a role in two of City's goals in the 3-0 win over Stoke on Sunday and believes the player is starting to find his feet in the Premier League. On occasions he's taken the wrong option, maybe shot when he, he should have passed and whatever, but uh, that's because he wants to, to make a mark on the game and I've always said to young players if, if you get an opportunity you've got to make the most of it and, and make your mark on, on the game that you've participated and uh, make people sit up and take notice of you. And certainly, Jed and uh, Daniel have done that in recent weeks. City go to Middlesbrough tonight. There's full match commentary from 7 o'clock here on BBC Radio Manchester. Bolton captain Kevin Nolan believes the Wanderers haven't yet had any luck so far this season. Bolton entertain Everton tonight at the Reebok, needing a win to avoid sinking deeper into relegation trouble. And Nolan feels they're just missing that little something. The way we're playing at the moment, it, it, it's just, you know, it's just taking that little bit of luck, what we just haven't had be, uh, at this, the beginning of the season. That little bit of luck we need. And because we've had it against us, you know, all the teams against us have had it today. Man United had it a few weeks ago, Arsenal had it against us. So I think, you know, once we get that little bit of luck, I think we can we can drive on. 
Elsewhere, Wigan that go to Fulham. There's coverage of all the games in the all-new Manchester sports from seven. Diego Maradona is to return to football as the national coach of Argentina. One of the game's all-time greats will be confirmed in the role next Tuesday, according to their FA, and will attend the friendly against Scotland at Hampden Park next month. Freddie Lundberg has become the latest high-profile player to make his move to Major League Soccer in the US. The former Arsenal and Sweden midfielder has moved to the Seattle Sounders. Wigan's Mark Calderwood will replace the injured Lee Smith on the wing for England's game against Australia in the Rugby League World Cup on Sunday. Smith scored a hat-trick of tries in the win over Papua New Guinea last Saturday. So does Calderwood feel any extra pressure? <laughs> uh, obviously, Smithy did well uh, uh, last week and uh, hopefully uh, we need to improve this week uh, a lot and uh, hopefully I can try and get the ball and hopefully I can try and score a fall, but if not, uh, a win will do. Later today, Andy Murray begins his quest to become the first man ever to win three Masters Series titles in a row. He plays Sam Query in Paris. And doctors say Seve Ballesteros' condition has improved following the third operation last week on his brain tumour. The next live action on the Northwest's biggest sports station. Comes tonight as this commentary of Manchester City's trip to Middlesbrough. Coverage two of Manchester United, Bolton, and Wigan. Tune in to the all-new Manchester Sports from seven. BBC Radio Manchester. It's just gone quarter to one on BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. How are you? Hi, Alan. Says Graham in Lancashire. Um, an offensive phone call is an offensive phone call, whether it's broadcast or not. Sod the BBC, he says. Thank you. Um, the two should be in court, the same as I and many others would be. Well, I think for the police to be involved, there has to be a complaint, I think. And although there have been 18,000 complaints, neither of the two recipients, if you like, well, the recipient of the message and the, the victim of the context of the message, neither of them have yet, as far as I know, complain to the police. We'll have to see. Maybe they will. Um, Danielle in Bolton. Hi. Hiya. What can we do for you? I'm just joining in the conversation. Um, I've never spoke to the radio before, so I've got to say I'm a little bit nervous. Well, you're very welcome, and I'm quite a bit nervous too, so don't worry. Never mind. Um, I was just really wanted to say that who's, who's never made a bad joke? All I'd say is when you, when you make a joke, you put yourself up there and you put yourself on the line, and it's not always going to be a hit. And I just think that really they've, they've obviously made a bad call, they've made a mistake, but who's not done that? Um, I think there's lots of comedians who sail close to the wind, and I just think you, you take what a comedian says with a pinch of salt. That's the nature of a comedian, and it only appeals to a percentage of people, and and it only only appeals a percentage of the time, and you choose to listen to it, and it brings enjoyment. So I, I think really, they're, um, like we said earlier, it's a bit of a witch hunt. Well, OK, it might be a witch hunt, um, and a lot of people are jealous of the money they earn, and I think we can include you and me in that, Danielle, can't we? <laughs> we're, absolutely, we're perfectly happy to be included in that. But, but although you're right in that comedians do jokes all the time, and, uh, you know, even Ken Dodd, the most innocent comedian in the world, he does 100 jokes, you laugh at 60, he's happy. Yeah. But... This is slightly more than that, isn't it? This is be, if they'd have if they'd played a joke on the woman herself mm. about her. If they'd played a joke on Andrew Sachs about him, well, okay, it might not have worked. But what the hell? They're both grown ups. They can live with it. But this is having a ringing somebody's grandfather. And okay, he's a famous actor, but ringing somebody's grandfather with something that might hurt him about his granddaughter is that acceptable? I, I know it's. It, there are those that would see it as funny, but but is it acceptable? Yeah, I'm not, I'm don't, not necessarily saying it's acceptable. No, I know. As I, 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 I say, it was more of a mistake, and I could obviously I put myself in that position if somebody rang my my granddad, and I, I wouldn't like it, and I'm sure he would be very unimpressed. But I don't think it's one of those things. When there's all the things that's happening in the world, and I know I know that shouldn't detract from it. But when there's everything happening in the world that is that's of a much larger nature that go unmissed, unnoticed, untrained, unchallenged, then I think. You've got to put it into perspective. It didn't. It, it wouldn't have hurt the granddad. I mean, as I said, you take you take what a comedian said with a pinch of salt. There could be absolutely no element of truth to it whatsoever. It's just like a knock knock joke. And the fact that it, yes, it's slightly distasteful, and the granddad therefore might not approve of the the taste and and the, the joke, the nature of the joke. What was actually said, I wouldn't necessarily call it abusive. Because only in, only okay. in the sense of you see what I'm saying. I, I do indeed. Can, can I ask you one? 
question that is utterly ingracious of me and you don't have to answer, but I think it's relevant because of the, the, the division of audiences like you and me. Yeah. How old are you? 27. 27. So as far as you're... You see, that would be the kind of age group that that programme was aimed at. It's, it's not aimed at an git like me. It's aimed at, <laughs> at, at your age group. And it's interesting to see that you just say, effectively what you're saying, it was a gag, get over it. Yeah, I mean, not, not, not as I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more sensitive than that. I'm a, I'm a very, very sensitive person. And, and, and I, 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 I do understand, I just don't think for everybody to be making such a hype of it. For example, the politicians, I've, I've made note on the politicians bit. Um, I, I think a no comment would have been more apt in that place. I do think it's making slight, slightly bit of a scapegoat of them because... I've had experiences with with crime. You know, there's a hell of a lot going on. You can't go around town at the moment without seeing a fight and all the rest of it. There's so much more for them to be concentrating on. And I think it's almost that the public's made a big thing of this. And the, and, and the politicians are jumping on the bandwagon to an extent, even by even by getting involved in it. It's, tick, it's tickle-tackle at the end of the day. And, and even to get involved when that, they've got so much more that they, they could be concentrating on or could mm. be concentrating on and I just think to even give an opinion on it really I think it would be much more tasteful to perhaps said no comment all right well good on you thank you very much for your call have a good day okay thank you very Cheers. much Bye. Bye. Yes, 0161228 The difference is that people don't ring you up on your answer phone and leave a message saying you're a mouthy git. They ring you live on air. <laughs> that's, that's not the only thing they say, David. Your first call is bang on. I'm getting a great majority. I'm betting a great majority of the complaints are identically worded and from the religious right. Oh, we're starting to blame the god botherers now for the complaints. Vinny in Warrington. Hiya, Vinny. Good afternoon, Alan. Good afternoon. Um, Alan, you made a few comments just before Danielle was on. Yeah. Um, about the police being... Um, about people making a complaint to the police about this phone call. Yes. Um, I think what people are actually overlooking is that the fact that this call was made, whether it went out live on air or, not, or pre-recorded, the call was actually made to Andrew Sachs. Yes. Now, apparently, the way I, the way I see it is, um, or the way I'm told it is, that... If a phone call in this country is deemed to be um, under a few categories, a couple of which are humiliating or distressing, it then becomes an offensive phone call, an obscene phone call. And apparently an obscene phone call in this country is a criminal offence. So whether or not it was actually aired, the call was made. He's got it on his answer phone, so there's evidence there, isn't there? So if they've been... Uh, if they've made... Um, uh, this obscene phone call, and it's classed as a criminal offence, and they're guilty of that, after the investigation will say, haven't they brought the BBC into disrepute? And if they have, are they not guilty of gross misconduct there? Now, whether, regardless of contractual obligations between themselves and the BBC, in most cases, a gross misconduct would result in instant dismissal, surely. Um, <laughs> blimey. All sorts of questions in there, most of which are, as the Americans say, way above my pay grade. But <laughs> here's, here's the first one. Uh, and it is, I, my understanding is that the police will not get involved as a result of a, a third party complaint. So in order for the police to be involved, even if de facto an offence has taken place, in order for the police to be involved, yeah. one of the two parties have to be, uh, have to complain. And the only one that can really complain to the police is Andrew Sachs. And frankly, yeah. I suspect he's not going to, but let's not get, go there. That's his decision and he's entitled to do as he pleases. Yeah. But until that happens, I suspect the cops aren't going to get involved. No. Because because it will be defended as a piece of entertainment. Now, you know, we can we can play that game for a long time. The bit about evidence, well, they don't need Andrew Sachs's answer phone for evidence. It's all over the internet. Yeah, well, uh, so they've it's, yeah, it's it's ready, what they've done. Yeah, it's ready me. available. So there's no denial that they made a phone call. This is where we come to the evidential bit. There's no denial they made a phone call. Yeah. They could, at a later date, deny the context, except, of course, it's readily available. Mm -hmm. Now coming to... To, um, the, the bit about their employment. Well, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that neither of them are employees of the BBC. I suspect they are both paid entertainers, uh, if you will, in an entirely different way, but the same as I. I'm not an employee of the BBC. The BBC cannot dismiss me. 
What it can do, what it can do is say that I am in breach of my contract to them and therefore they're terminating it. So they can say, you have broken your contract, go away, we're not paying you anymore. They are entitled to do that as any other um, contracted individual engaging the services of another. So they can't sack them in the sense that you and I would understand it. They can only right. say, you're in breach of contract, therefore we are terminating, or you've terminated it by your breach, and then there'd be a rowing court and all the rest of it. So that, that's just the mechanics of it. But whether they brought the BBC into yeah. disrepute, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that will have to. That'll be part of the Director General's inquiry, I suspect. Yeah, it's just it's just a sad fact that um, you know all this has been um, being masked because it's humour. It's been graded as humour and a prank, and I just think that's that's ridiculous. I think they should actually look at look at it in the sense that, like you say, whether Andrew Sachs makes the complaint to the police or not, a criminal offence. But, but Vinnie, do you, I mean, just because of what you just said, do, do you concede that they did it as a joke? Whether it worked as a joke is irrelevant yeah. for the answer. Do you think they thought they were playing a joke when they did it? Yeah, I imagine they, they thought that. You see, um, well, they, let, me, let me just offer you, if, if the police investigated this and the two men went to court and said, we plead not guilty to a malicious phone call, because there was no malice intended, it was a joke. Now, most people would say what you've just said, and that, yeah, okay, it was a joke, it was an awful one, it should never have happened, but it was a joke. It wasn't malicious. Do you know what I mean? So you're then into the idiosyncrasies of what is a malicious phone call. Is it something that's meant to hurt, or something that's meant to be funny and doesn't work? Mm, well, surely, no. in, in Andrew Sachs' defence, should he, and I'm not saying he will, but should he say, well, Hang on, I was humiliated and distressed and offended by that, that. That's utterly irrelevant. In order, in order to convict someone, you have to convict them on what they did, not what happened as a result. You have to convict... If you want to convict them of making a malicious phone call, you have to show malice. And if there was no malice, it was just aggressive, vile, despicable, unacceptable humour, that's all it was. Because I thought they'd, they'd changed it from, like, malice, uh, a malicious phone call to offensive or abusive. Is it abusive or offensive? Abu abusive, yes. Offensive's tricky, because I could ring up and say, I really, 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 really fancy you. And the woman can say, I've never been so offended in all my life. <laughs> As she probably would. Have a good day, Vinny. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought I'd say it before bye -bye. you did. Phil <laughs> <No. laughs> in Wigan, I'm told, is in a pie shop. Right, but he's in Wigging, so he was bound to be. I yeah, you, Phil. You've just dragged me out of the pie shop. You're oh, on about Will you be all right? Are you starting to shake? <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I'm shaking now. No, I'm sat on a cold bench outside Hampson's in the marketplace. Hampson? Well, they're not bad pies anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got for us, Phil? Well, all it was was it's just uh, my comment on what the previous lady said. Something okay. about this is the type of thing that comedians do. Yeah. Who the hell brands Brand and, and Ross? A comedian, that's just my comment. I've, had better, I've seen better comedians at my granddad's funeral. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but you don't have to be a good comedian to be branded a comedian, do you? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I like I mean, I, I've heard better jokes after two or three pints than what these fellas tell. And that Jonathan Ross, it, uh, Ross, I should say, his face like to smack to us, isn't it? You know, he has, not, it. Uh, and, and, he, and, yeah. and there's a few knocking about at the moment. I'd like to give it that smack. Man, I'm just looking in the shop window now. Man looks like one. I'm bloody freezing. <laughs> well, get back. Go and get a meat and tater. You'll be right as out. <laughs> okay, Cheers, right. mate. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Have a good lunch. Morning Sound Better with Eamon O'Neill and Diane Oxford. Eamon and Diane. Tail ends of conversations that you may have heard. Mine was in the pub the other Saturday at lunchtime, and that's how his teeth came to be found in the fridge. <laughs> Eamon and Diane and you. Jen in Ashton wants to give us the tail end of a conversation that she heard. My mum said you can keep those underpants. <laughs> <laughs> that was a young man to his pal as he was getting off the bus. The station with Eamon and Diane for breakfast. Yes, They're so pretty. Back tomorrow morning from 6 at BBC Radio Manchester. Somebody emailed yesterday and I never got around to reading it. It's a simple question that he or she poses. I think it's a he called Paul. I responded to the consultation about the TIF proposals but can't find where the results are published. Do you know if and when we'll be given the facts? I think they're available 
on the website of the Association of Greater Manchester Authorities, or the GMBTE. <laughs> There's commentary on City at Middlesbrough, news of United, Bolton and Wigan in the all-new Manchester Sports tonight from 7. I get everything wrong. The website you need is GM Future. So if you go to GM Future and there you will find the, the results of the consultation. Another hour of Bezik yet. Brace yourself. 95.1 FM, DAB Digital Radio, and the World Wide Web. This is Manchester, BBC Radio Manchester. At one o'clock, Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross are suspended by the BBC in a driver's jail for knocking down and killing a woman in Bolton. Oldham plan a tour to Israel. Well, this afternoon should be largely dry with some sunny spells. There's just a chance of a snow flurry over the hills. Top temperatures, 7 Celsius. Still down to one lane across Barton Bridge, clockwise on the M60. There's been a fuel spillage after an accident there, and the queue's now back to Junction 7. Good afternoon, I'm Richard Stead. The BBC suspended Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand. It follows abusive calls made to the Faulty Towers actor Andrew Sachs, saying Russell Brand had slept with his granddaughter. There have been 18,000 complaints and calls for them to be sacked. The Salford MP and Community Secretary Hazel Blears isn't impressed. As a licence payer, what I want to see is I do want the BBC to entertain as well as inform me. Yeah. Well, Mr Brand and Mr Ross, you've just heard, have been suspended, so there'll be an inquiry into what's happened to them. I don't want to prejudge it, but I think what most people feel is that what they've done is puerile, it's juvenile, it isn't entertainment, actually, I, I know, and no, they've no. hurt somebody. A driver who knocked down and killed a woman in Bolton nearly three years ago has finally been jailed for six and a half years. Jonathan Alley reports. Laura Entwistle was killed as she crossed Wigan Road in Dean in January 2006 after a night out. The car that hit her didn't stop. Daniel Taylor's now admitted causing the 44-year-old's death through dangerous driving. He was jailed for six and a half years at Manchester's Minchell Street Crown Court. The judge in sentencing him said he had an appalling driving record and on the night he killed Mrs Entwistle, he'd been driving at dangerously high speeds. A Greater Manchester MP is using a constituent's experience to back his calls for a fund to compensate the victims of terror attacks abroad. Makerfield's Ian McCartney says Jonathan Green and his son went back to a hotel in Egypt three years ago to help the victims of a bombing. But Mr McCartney says there was little help for them when they returned home. There is an overriding patriotic case for establishing a fund to compensate fellow citizens and their families who become victims of overseas terrorism. As a constituency MP, I've seen and heard at first hand the suffering, mentally and physically, of innocent victims. The government's giving more than £100 million to build new homes in Salford. The PFI cash will be used to bring council-owned homes in Pendleton up to the government's decent home standard. It'll see the majority of homes refurbished, with some areas undergoing complete redevelopment to provide new houses. A campaign has been launched to improve the image of Withenshaw. Photographs of real life in the area will be put on the web. Elaine Green runs the stables in Withenshaw Park and has lived in the area for nearly 25 years. The image that people have sort of clung on to now where they look at it as being the pits, that's not the case. Whereas in the past, maybe, you know, they might have had a couple of valid points. It's changed now and people do need to see that. I mean, the amount of money that's been put into it, the amount of work that the local people have put into it as well needs to be recognised. So I think this campaign really is important. Lufthansa is to take control of BMI, one of the largest airlines at Manchester Airport. The German airline will now own more than 80% of BMI and the deal is expected to be completed early next year. BBC Radio Manchester, sports with Delic Lloyd. Oldham Athletic are considering a pre-season tour to Israel in the build-up to the 2009-10 season. The tour, which is expected to be pencilled in for July, could see Oldham play the likes of Maccabee Haifa and Maccabee Tel Aviv. 
Manchester City will be aiming to avoid a repeat of their last visit to the Riverside when they go to Middlesbrough tonight. City lost 8-1 on Teesside on the final day of last season. Manchester United play West Ham at Old Trafford. Bolton entertain Everton at the Reebok and Wigan travel to Fulham. Follow the action in the all-new Manchester Sports from 7. Diego Maradona is to return to football as the national coach of Argentina. One of the game's all-time greats will be confirmed in the role next Tuesday, according to their FA, and will attend the friendly against Scotland at Hamden Park next month. And India have closed the first day of the third test against Australia on a commanding 296 for three in Delhi. They lead the four-match series 1-0. BBC Radio Manchester, satellite weather with Heather Stocks. Well, this afternoon, many of us will get away with a dry afternoon. There's just a chance of seeing an isolated shower. And over the hills, those showers could turn up a wintry or a little bit of snow mixed in there. Top temperatures today, it feels cool, 7 Celsius. Lunchtime belong to Bezik. Alan Bezik. BBC Radio Manchester. We're getting very involved and I've no complaint at that we're getting very very involved in this issue about broadcasting so before I go to Sylvia in Stockport which I will do in a moment but before then let me just tell you something that happened must be 10 years ago now I've been a, a phone in type it's not all I do but it's, it's all anyone knows I do for God's sake well there you are but I've been a phone in presenter now for quarter of a century 25 years yeah I know before that, I used to do a, a, a sort of um, advice phone-in. So if you chuck them in as well, we're looking at 30 years plus. Long time. And I suppose I've earned a reputation within the business. Whether, whether I've got one outside is not relevant to this conversation and, frankly, is a bit silly. But I've earned a bit of a reputation in the business. So every now and then, I'm invited to take part in in-house, by that I mean within the broadcast business, in-house discussions. And about ten years ago, I took part in a training programme for, for phone-in presenters. I didn't even know there was one. And I, I took part. And my part was in a debate. And the debate was debating one simple question. Is it ever acceptable for a phone-in presenter to be offensive to a caller. That was the query. That was the, the, the debate topic. And I was on the side of the answer, yes. It is acceptable, sometimes, for a phone-in presenter to be offensive to a caller. Because it is. Sometimes it's not. Well, these guys, OK, they weren't doing a phone-in, they weren't doing a live programme, they were doing a pre-rec and the like. So, did Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand, knowing that it was a pre-rec, think, well, if we do this and it's not acceptable, that's OK. Pre-rec, I'm sorry, a pre-recorded programme. If we do this and it's not OK, they won't put it out. And uh, who was it that was commenting the other day? It was Andrew Alexander, the actor who's about to become, well, the comic actor who's about to become the chair of Countdown, an occasional chair of Have I Got News For You. And he said, if they just put out the whole of the recording of I Got News For You, the BBC would be closed down <laughs> because of the summers. But they don't. They edit it out. And that, because it's pre-recorded, that gives the presenters and the, and the, guest, the guests on the programme rather more leeway because they can go a lot further knowing that if they go over the mark it won't be broadcast so is that what's happened here and is it ever ever acceptable for a radio program and i say radio rather than television television's a medium that you you watch you are not a participant but radio it's much more intimate. Radio is a participatory, even if you're just listening to the radio. When I listen to the radio, I listen to it in my car. I listen to it in my home. I relate with it. It's part of me. I'm with the programme. You don't do that with telly. Telly's like going to the theatre. It happens over there in the corner. Radio is rather more intimate. So is it ever acceptable, in your view, for a radio programme to offend? 0161 228 2255. If you've something to say, feel free. 
And uh, Russell Brand has been doorstepped. Again, I'm in jargon. Newspaper and television reporters are on his doorstep. And as he left his home this afternoon, he said to reporters, in that squeaky little effect voice of his, it would be silly of me to speak without thinking, because that's caused all this trouble in the first place. I'm sorry I upset Mr Sachs. What did I hear you say? I'll bet you are. Sylvia in Stockport. Hiya, Sylvia. Hi. Sorry to keep you waiting. Okay. What can we do for you? Um, well, I basically agree with the young lady who was on earlier on, the 27-year-old. Yes. Who said they were being used as scapegoats. I think they should be warned not to do it again. I think it's wrong to sack them. Um, there are a lot of people involved here, the production team, etc. And I think they just got carried away. They certainly wouldn't have meant to hurt anyone. Um, it's certainly not my kind of humour. I hate sick humour. But um, I just think it's been taken too far. And it's very, very wrong to compare it to the Nazis and Jews, um, buildings being bombed and all that kind of thing. It, it was just, they just got carried away. And um, as I say, they just shouldn't do it again. And the production team should be told they shouldn't let this kind of thing through. But um, can, I, can I just give you a piece of information that, that you may want to take on board? And that is that the production team already know that this kind of thing shouldn't be put through. The yeah. BBC, and I tell you, I've crossed the line so many times, it's crazy. The BBC have very, very strict guidelines, and you're not allowed to produce at the BBC, and not many presenters get away with not reading something called the producer guidelines. And, and they are so detailed, the producer guidelines. It's a huge book. It even tells you about how you get a registration number for a car to use in a film. So that, you know, because there are registration numbers you can use in a film that aren't real. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's how, that's how ninny-picky it is. And they will have read those guidelines and been taught about those guidelines. So they, they should know anyway. Well, I think in that case, they need warning and being told they shouldn't let it through again. And if they do, then they will lose their jobs. I think that's the thing to do. I think everyone should get a warning and not just be dismissed like that. This humour's on TV all the time. Um... And it is different that um, it involves a phone call. And I'm certainly a big Andrew Sachs fan, but I don't, I don't think um, he would want them to be dismissed like this. I think he's a big enough man to, um, you know, let it go, really. But they should be warned not to do it again. If it happens again, they're all out, you know. All right. Everyone Look. deserves a warning. Everyone deserves and a warning. They and be they are definitely being used as scapegoats. I think who it's by? Who? who? Uh, the gen well, the so MPs... <laughs> MPs always take, um, you know, make use of this kind of thing, don't they? Mm. Um, I think the general public is just, um, well, some of them, um, they just sort of follow like sheep and just say what everyone else does. Um, but certainly these people should just get a warning not to do it again. If they do, they're out. You know. All right, good on you. Sylvia, thank you yeah, very okay. much indeed. Right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Sylvia says, come on, come on. The, get them in the office, give them a damn good talking to, and then let's all move on. They're being used as scapegoats. MPs are jumping on the bandwagon, and the written media's going barmy. Lorraine in Bolton. Hi, Lorraine. Hello, Alan. What can we do for you? Um, just a similar comment, actually, about this um, mess that... Um, <laughs> That's what it is, isn't it? It is. Yes, it's a it mess. It is. Um, I actually watch Jonas, Jonathan Ross when he's on TV. On um, Friday night. Not yeah. because of him as much as the calibre of guests that he has. Mm. The other month they had uh, Stevie Wonder on. Yeah. And uh, if you want that kind of... If you want to see that kind of a guest, you've got to go with Jonathan Ross. So when you actually go on his TV programmes, you're up for the game. Because he does. He pushes it and pushes it. And he, he likes to be the saucy, cheeky chappy. I don't think he is. I just think he's near the knuckle most of the time. And... Um, he isn't, to me, he isn't funny. He doesn't have the humour. And he gets paid mega bucks, which, OK, it's like anything else. If you can get it, you can get it. But this... <laughs> yes, yes was, we, we'd all take it, wouldn't we? <laughs> well, you would. You Without would. a doubt, You yes, would, but it's part yeah. of my licence fee. <laughs> well, yes, it so is. It's not just right yours. I mean, it's, eight, it's 18 million. It's about it's, it's about a million. Uh, sorry, about 100,000 people's licence fees, isn't well, it? That's really? what he gets a year, is it? Yeah. Oh, so, right. No, that's what he's got for his contract, which I think is three years. But right. It, it's well, a fair whack. It's fair whack. But it, on this morning that Radio Manchester it was saying about... Um, Russell Brown was on saying, we blurted it out, didn't we? 
as though they were like a couple of schoolboys who'd been caught out doing something naughty. Mm. And, oh dear, what shall, how can we sort this out? But if you are a broadcaster, you have to police yourself in a way. You've got to have a standard which you will not cross. This was premeditated. He's gone ahead and done this, thinking it was a jolly jip. It's not. And I'm quite happy for him to be... Um, brought in front of whoever you have as headmaster down at the BBC <laughs> oh, and give them a good old, um, you know, £18 yes. million, pound, you should be able to keep your mouth shut from time to time. Mm. There, there is a slight difficulty, um, and I'll tell you what it is, but you might consider it to be irrelevant, and that's perfectly acceptable, but the slight difficulty is that the BBC, because of its privileged position, does indeed push the boundaries all the time. It has a reputation for being a solid broadcaster, if you like to yeah. that phrase. But it's also very much a broadcaster at the edge as well. I, I offered one earlier, Till Death Us Do Part. That was groundbreaking in its day. Groundbreaking. And there were calls for the BBC to be closed down and all sorts when that came out. That's part of its role. Have I got news for you? A ribald quiz that has no quiz in it at all anymore. It's just comedy at the expense of politics. The news quiz on Radio 4 does much the same thing. It is... It's part of its remit to go to the line. And sometimes if you're going to go regularly to the line, and I've been there, you sometimes step over it. Do we accept that in this well, case? Alan, you just said, uh, have I got news for you. Mm. From, from back to the Napoleonic Wars, politicians have been pilloried. Mm. That's what they're there for. Yes. You know, they used to do cartoons about them. It's what, it's what it's about. If you're in politics, you should take the good and the bad. This duo have actually decided to phone somebody up to make these comments. They've done this premeditated. This isn't about politics, silly or otherwise. I, indeed, but nor was, nor was till death us do part. That, I didn't like that, that either. Well, you, I'm not asking <laughs> you to like it. Good <laughs> Lord, if we're getting on to liking things, I can't bear Ross or Brand. I'd have them both horse no. just for being who they are, never but mind what they do on the telly. But specifics, Alan, which is what I am mm, doing yes. now. Yes, okay. Let's, let's face it, they've premeditatedly got somebody's phone number, and I don't think that would be a very easy thing to do with uh, Mr Sykes, and they've decided what they're going to say. And it, 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 it's inappropriate, it's, it's smut, it, it's just not, it's not broadcasting. You push the brandish with broadcasting when you go to Iraq, you push the broadcast when you talk politics. Not when you ring up a grandfather and say, I've slept with your granddaughter. That is beyond... All beyond right. policy. That's beyond broadcasting. All right. Good on you. Thank you All very right, much Alan. indeed. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Lorraine, thank you. If you've got a point of view, I'd love to hear it. And it doesn't have to be about that. It can be about anything. Please don't read my name out. Thank you, says our emailer. Regarding the Ross Brand incident, I'm very pleased that so many people have complained about it. I've volunteered at Childline for the past three years and have heard countless children explaining, often through tears, how their life is ruined by bullying and the nasty behaviour of others. It's hard enough to try to explain that what's happening to them is wrong and not their fault if two highly paid BBC broadcasters are allowed to broadcast such a mean and bullying attack on a man and his granddaughter without censure. I've been very surprised that such behaviour seems to be accepted as just a bit of fun by many. I myself have been bullied and laughed at at work by my boss, partly for a physical characteristic over which I have no control. This involved other members of staff being encouraged to laugh and jeer at me too. To my knowledge, and certainly not in my presence, none of my colleagues ever spoke out against this. I therefore find it comforting that there are people who are still willing to complain and make a fuss about bullying and mean behaviour, even when it's not directed at them personally. And that, as I say, comes from someone who wishes not to have his or her name read out. I thank you for the broadcast, for the letter, uh, the email. And I do always say, if you don't want your name broadcast, one of the reasons we only use first names on this program is because things are often said that in the heat of the moment that are quite personal, sometimes by me 
often by by those who ring in and often about somebody else so we never use second names for that reason and if you don't want your name to be used we need to have it for our benefit for our records but you don't have to use that name on air you can come on and be you can come on and be Alan of Atherton if you wish it doesn't matter but we do need a contact, and I have one for this person. If you're sending me an email or tax that says, you, and you don't want me to use the name that is on it, then please put it at the top, as this person did, and that way I'll know before I start rather than when I get to the end. Because I read these things live. I don't read them and then filter them. I read them live, because I think that's how a phone call or, a, or any other communication would be. Gary in Manchester... Bezik, if I went up to someone in a pub that I vaguely knew and said, I've had sex with your granddaughter, I'd expect a bloody nose. Childish idiots Ross and Brand should also get a bloody nose and take the full blame for their actions. It's easy to attack people from behind a camera or a microphone, isn't it? Gary in Manchester. Well, you're right there. It is. John Thompson. He knows what he knows. You know, Colleen Rooney. Kenneth Williams, isn't it? Oh, yes. I mean, yes, I've been shopping. All right. I've been shopping. Yeah, buying more things. John Thompson. He knows what he means. Do you know what annoys me is that song, uh, You've Lost That Loving Feeling. It segue into Grease, doesn't it? You've You've lost that love. Now it's gone, gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do, 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 John Thompson's take on the world. Good stuff. It's well done. Great songs and wholesome. Saturday from 11 on BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. How are you? Oh, good. So am I. And what a way it is for us to be. 0161 228 Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk. And of course, you can text on 07786. 206951. Linda in Audenshaw, I'll be with you very shortly. But right now it's 20 past one and time for the BBC Radio Manchester News headlines with Richard Stepp. The BBC suspended Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand following abusive calls made to the Faulty Towers actor Andrew Sachs. A driver who knocked down and killed a woman in Bolton nearly three years ago has finally been jailed for six and a half years. And the government's giving more than £100 million to build new homes in Salford and refurbish others. Manchester's weather dry and cold with the chance of snow in Pennine areas, highs of seven Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. On the clockwise M60, still down to one lane after an accident where a tanker involved has spilt diesel over the carriageway. So after Junction 10, the traffic is queuing back right the way back now to Junction 6 at Sale. Long delays to expect there uh, for a while yet. Not looking too bad on other routes, though. The M602 heading on towards the uh, centre of Manchester is running well. It's looking good at the Swinton interchange. And Queen's Road at Chatham Hill, that's uh, still the lane closed with the bridge maintenance work going on near to uh, Smedley Road, the work on the railway bridge. Still one or two slight delays on the Metrolink system between Bury and Altrincham follows uh, a breakdown of a tram earlier on today. If you spot any other problems, call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm David Powell. David, I have to say it's probably got a delightful history, but I, I don't think I'd want to live in Smelly Road. Smelly Road? Yeah, didn't you just say Smed- Smed- no, Smelly Smedley Road? <laughs> I really must pay more attention. Thank you very much. Smedley Road. I thought you said Smelly Road. I'm not living there. (laughs) Although I probably belong there. Thank you. 2020 traffic means you get an update every 20 minutes through the day. I blame the producer. (laughs) Linda in Ordenshaw. Hi, Linda. Hello. What can we do for you, Linda? Uh, Well, actually... I rang ages ago after about four previous callers um, about, I was saying about bullying. Yes. I think it's it's really a case of bullying. And, and what you've just read out previously from the, the email, the anonymous emailer, I fully agree with because I, I work with children myself and you hear it so many times like it was a joke or it goes too far. But these people are very high profile and it, it is bullying. It's a form of bullying, and they can't really be seen to just get away with it. That oh, it's just a joke. You know, that's fine. What message is that giving? And uh, another, no, another sort of, I, I, another sort of thing on. about it's a happy slapping uh, 
type of, mm-hmm. uh, of thing where they film it because it's funny to some people. Yes. But it is quite... It can be viewed as quite serious at other people's expense. It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, although... Having said, I, I'll say this, but obviously because it was pre-recorded, this wouldn't have gone out. But imagine they rang a, 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 I don't know, a black guy and left a message on there saying, I've slept with your N-word granddaughter. That wouldn't go out. And if it, and if it was a live programme, they would be sacked, wouldn't they? Yeah, but Without the a doubt. now, it's not about the broadcasting or who's let it mm. go out. It's the fact that it's, it is out. And because it's out, and because a lot of young people, you know, Russell Brand is quite high profile. He's a bit of a bit of a lad and um, a role model to, to many people, I'm sure. And it can't be seen to... It's gone too far now, and, and something has to be sort of done to make it look... What, what sort of thing do you think should be done? I mean, at the oh, moment, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that's fair I don't enough. Know that. I mean, well, okay, but they're, it's they're already co- out, and, mm. that, and that's it. And it is, it is really a form of bullying that a lot of people do get away with, and we should have no tolerance with it. All right, good on you, Linda. No tolerance. Thank you very much. I don't mean you, but no tolerance of no, this particular as far thing. As, you know what should be done. That's something. That's what the debate is about. It's throwing all sorts of uh, all sorts of ideas into the ring, mm. and then deciding what should be done. It's hard to know, isn't it? It is. Good on you. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. In Barcelona, rainy Barcelona, and it's sunny here, so we don't care. Um, in reference to all this Ross Brand controversy, I'd like to pose a question to you, Alan. Are you worried about the outcome? Can you imagine that in the future you, as a presenter, have to refrain from telling us obnoxious listeners to sod off? Andrew, sod off. I'm getting it out of the way now before they stop it. So, Andrew, in Barcelona, I've told you before, I hate you and everything you stand for. <laughs> and, and just sod off. <laughs> Thank you very much. 0161 228 2255. I went to Barcelona for a trip, and you know, everybody raves about it, but I didn't think it was that good. Celebrity obsessed bandwagon jumpers. That's what Chris says. Everybody who complains about it is. Brand did sleep with Andrew Sachs's granddaughter. She's admitted it. So it's not as if there's been any salander. Can we please get on to something else now? Well, Chris, as long as you keep sending me emails about it, it's going to be a bit tricky for me to get on with something else. Another Chris, and maybe it's the same one in disguise. I'm getting a bit tired of hearing about these two talentless individuals, and if I never hear or see of them again, it'll be too soon. But whether this was broadcast or not, it was still grossly offensive to leave this kind of message on someone's answer machine. They're lucky that some large male relative is not on their way around to inflict serious physical physical injury. I would if it were my granddaughter, says Chris. Here's to a Ross and brandless future. A Rossless. We're going to have a Rossless future and a brandless future. Well, you're not, you see, you're not, because if the BBC did sack either of those individuals, the queue to employ them elsewhere because of their popularity would be great. Simon in Awood. Hiya, Simon. Good afternoon, Alan. Good afternoon. Well. I'm very well, thank you. Good, and I'm sure you're really enjoying all this uh, Well, it's nice. I, I, I like to see mud fly and land somewhere else every now and then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Fair good enough. to see somebody else getting it in the neck. However, sure. however many people had to get hurt to bring it about. <laughs> let, oh. me, let me just start by saying I cannot abide Brand and Ross. They... They, make, they both make my flesh crawl. However... <laughs> but apart from that, they're all right. <laughs> apart from that, yeah, you know... I'm uh, sorry, go on, yes. Uh, I, I mean, uh, on, this in, on this issue, I have to say, this has now gone on far too long. Um, apparently, y- you've said, and it's, it's a fact, that the show was pre-recorded. And so, so we hear, yes. And it was done two, three, four days before it was broadcast. So... Andrew Sachs had three or four days to phone the BBC and say, don't put that out, that's offensive. He didn't. So he had the opportunity before this all blew up to stop it and did not take that opportunity. Um, Now, one of your callers 
earlier on suggested that uh, it might be a way of kick-starting his career. And I, you know, wouldn't want uh, restarting his career. I wouldn't want to sort of smear him with that. But I would like to know why he didn't sort of chirp up and say, well, please don't do this. I, I've got to disillusion you slightly from two possible points. The first one is that, frankly, uh, from all I've heard about the man prior to these incidents, I'm talking about Andrew Sachs now, mm -hmm. he is a gentleman. Oh, yeah. Um, and maybe that's why. Um, also, again, coming up short slightly, there's a story flying round. I cannot gainsay this, I, uh, nor indeed vouchsafe, but there is a story flying round that he did ask for it not to be broadcast, but that was disregarded. Now, if that's true, that changes your position somewhat. It, well, it, it doesn't change my fundamental position, which indeed. is that... I, that they're I, both still I, worthless. Well, no, I, the, <laughs> I, I still don't think that this is, you know, the, the huge affair that everybody's turning it into. Um, I would hate to be their producer, um, A, because of the amount of uh, fertiliser that they're about to land themselves in, <laughs> but also because, let's face it, you have to listen to them record the show, and then you've got to go and listen to it again to make sure oh, it's all fit that. for content. Worse than that, you've got to listen to it when it goes out as well. <laughs> well, yeah. So, th 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 I mean, that's... If they weren't being paid for it, I'm sure that'd be classed as cruel and unusual punishment. Well, I don't know. I think the queue of people to produce successful programmes like that is long. Yeah, I suppose it is. Uh, long. A lot longer than the queue to produce yours, anyway. But, well, yeah, uh, indeed, considerably longer. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of the punishments of life. That's <laughs> why they don't last long, you know, they get sent to this. It's like going to the gulag. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure I want to go anywhere near your gulags, but... No, uh, indeed, you you're for... probably wise. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day, Al. I'll do my best. Ta -ra, ta -ra, 0161-228-2255. So can we expect to see headlines in the red tops about what the shop finds on your hard drive. Hope it's interesting. Ross and Brand will now pay the price for being celebrity fast-talking wisecrackers. They should be made to donate the proceeds of the next two or three jobs for the BBC to something like Childline or some other such charity. It was an ill-perceived moment of stupidity, and that is all. And the reference to my hard drive is that my Apple computer decided it didn't want to play today. So I've taken it in the only bag big enough to carry it, which was an Ikea bag, to the Apple shop. And they will now tinker with it and do whatever else it requires to bring it back to life. Certainly the mallet I used on it didn't help. Much to my chagrin. Yeah, I, I actually rang their, their helpline on an ordinary telephone number, not one of those 08 thingamajigs, an ordinary telephone number and uh, was eventually transferred to India and spent an hour and a half on the phone with a lad in India who talked me right the way through it. And we had a bit of trouble with the English, but he was so courteous and so helpful. You can't, you can't criticise. Now, that's not to say if it had been in England, it would have been different. And I don't, know why, I don't know why Sarah's laughing, but I've just been sent a note. Is she laughing at my, at my dead computer or just laughing? Andy in Rincon says he's going to make an official complaint for your rudeness to Andy in Barcelona. Well, there you go. He brought it on himself, is my defence, Mr Runcorn. And you can go as well. And, and another Andy, only this one's rather more formal. Andrew in Holmes Chapel, I mean. Hi there. Um, I just bring up because after all this with um, Jonathan Ross from Russell Brand, the <coughs> Channel Four have a program, um, Phone Phone Jacker, and they they ring up and make prank calls and and things like that. And I just think it's it's wrong that with all the advertising to stop children and adults as well um, making prank calls to the emergency services and things like that. And on one hand you're saying no, but on the other hand you're paying people a lot of money to do it. Mm. I just think it's it's not it's wrong. Well, we, they didn't ring the emergency services on... on no, no, that. but it's still a technically a prank call, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Very definitely a prank call. Without, you, there's no way. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. All right, good on you. Right. Yep, Thank you very it. much. Here, here's, a, here's a quotation for you that's just been sent in by Victoria. Uh, Freud says of aggressive jokes, this is Sigmund, not Clement, by making our enemy small... 
inferior, despicable or comic. We achieve in a roundabout way the enjoyment of overcoming him, to which the third person bears witness by his laughter. That's aggressive jokes. May I suggest that the overdeveloped egos of Brandon Ross were stung by the fact that Mr. Sachs was not answering his phone when they expected him to, to present himself for interview. Their puerile joke was an attempt to get the audience to side with them against their absent interviewee as a form of punishment for that absence. It backfired. They are now the ones to look small, inferior and despicable. Now their salaries should be deflated in line with their egos. If we start... If we start paying people what they're worth, then life might be hard for some. Jeff in Eaton Mersey. Hiya. Hello, Alan. What have you got? Um, my sister and brother-in-law came over from Canada last year on holiday. Yeah. And uh, watched several TV programmes and were amazed at the amount of swearing that was going on on TV. And yet there's no swearing at all, apart from what you say occasionally, on the radio. Very rarely hear it on the radio. Hmm. Yeah, in Canada, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, you can't swear on the TV, but you can do what you want on the radio. Yeah, it is odd. It, it's like that in the United States as yeah, well. well they, yes. they have some very, very aggressive radio presenters, mm. and, and they're just beginning to to make headway into television, but not much. I mean, you, you even get the, the, the C word to be mentioned over here now at one time. That was absolute curse at one time, but that's getting mentioned more and more, I noticed. Uh, Eamon and Jimmy on a Sunday morning, you know, their, their programme, uh, they won't tell any rude or PC jokes. Non-PC, yes, they won't. No. Um, and yet, they say they will when they win the lottery, you know, they put a whole programme on a lottery. That's all right, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, uh, that is... She's got a, a punchline, she won't say anything, but don't push me past my mothers. Yeah. And yet, Joe Brand uh, repeats that quite often on Live from the Apollo on the BBC television. She does, and, and uh, I thought like... Same joke, but she, she can say on the telly, but Dan can't say it on the radio. No, when we, I, I said earlier that in this country, the radio is regarded as a much more intimate medium. It's much closer, and that's not to say better or worse, but it's much closer to those listening. And if I'm watching a film and, you know, some American actor says, you're your mother effer, and then shoots him, I just think, well, that's part of the film, and, yeah. you know, I, I, I must admit, I, I don't feel comfortable about it, but, but it's there. But if I heard it on the radio, if I hear it, there was a spell where they had a series of afternoon plays on BBC Radio 4, and it was almost compulsory, and I couldn't listen. Yeah. Because yeah. It, it just, and I, as I said yesterday, the F word doesn't bother me, I hear it all the time, and, and have been known to use it when cross, but uh, frankly... It's, it doesn't belong on. It doesn't belong on our radio. When I say our radio, I mean UK radio. But, yeah, yeah. but I don't know. The radio aimed at young people. Given that it's the parlance, often maybe, maybe it does belong. I don't know. Yeah. What you, I went to see uh, Chubby Brown some years ago at the Davenport Lord. Theatre in Stockport. Oh, that's where I up. saw him as well. Entire long ago that was because there's obviously no Davenport now. But uh, it took my wife along, and she was quite embarrassed by it all. Hmm. I found the humour funny, but there was just too much swearing. Yeah. You can put, you could have put his act into three quarters of the time because that all the swear words. Well, that would, and, you and know, would have been, in my opinion, funnier. Yeah, it wasn't the Davenport I saw him. It was the Stockport Plaza, and he's coming back. But I, I went. And uh, I'm, I've no real desire to go and see Chubby Brown for, because his reputation precedes him quite mm. rightly. And I went because I was making this documentary about offensive comedians. And I thought, actually, some of his humour would survive if he wasn't doing what he's doing. It would still be funny. You go and see Bernard, and I like Bernard, we had the late Bernard, yeah. but you go and see Bernard and you get a very, very funny comedian who F's and blinds a bit and doesn't care whose corns he treads on. You go see Roy Chubby Brown and you get just this, for me, ju just this tirade of filth. It's just a word. Yeah, and, and sometimes not much humour. No. People go there just to go, ha ha, he swore, he said the C word. <laughs> exactly. And Every you think, well, I want more than that. Yeah, but the stupid thing is on TV, when they say the F word, everybody laughs. Yeah. It, they say it to get the laugh. Mm. And it's not necessary in a lot of the conversations. Well, it, it certainly isn't necessary, but, but, but necessary. There's some jokes where you've got to use it because it, it, yeah. it is the, the actual part of the joke that's, that's yeah. a bit. But given, given that 
I, I diminish what I do for a living, but given radio and television is just a bit of frippery entertainment, yeah. none of it's necessary. Me sitting here, I, I don't wish to diminish you in any way, Jeff, but you and me having this conversation, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's not no. relevant. It's not important. No. And so to say it's, it, it's not necessary, well, frankly, none of it is. We got by without telly for thousands of years, yeah. didn't we? How, how all these people have said they've not heard or seen this? Jonathan Ross, etc. Mm. thing, because it's been on the TV, etc. Mm. Um, the, the, the granddaughter's been on Sky Television this morning saying, you know, what happened between her and Ross uh, is completely between her and Ross. Should uh, be. Not yeah. Ross, I beg your pardon. I know Russell, what you mean. Russell, Russell, the, the, the one pardon. slime's much the same as another slime, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, you know, she's sort of saying that, yes, there was something going on, but that's private between us. It doesn't have to be broadcast. Well, that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Kiss and tell, you well, know. Do the little thing just before you go to your news and etc. Well, thank you for keeping uh, me on time. I, <laughs> I fail so often myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's been something on the TV this morning about the Buzzcocks and Alan Titchmouse. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, saying that they, they interviewed several people going into the Buzzcocks uh, programme being pre-recorded. Yeah. And they said, oh, no, that was perfectly all right, what Ross and uh, Brandon got up to. Yeah. yeah and they interviewed the Alan Titchmouse audience who were slightly older they're all saying, oh, sack them, suspend them, do this, do that. Well, they, they, so that's it, yeah. what a audience it's aimed at. Well, indeed, the division, because uh, I watch Never Mind the Buzzcocks, and yes, they, they swear on that occasionally, but I think the programme is hilarious in places, although, frankly, some days... It, it's a bit... And the guy that presents it, whose name I've forgotten, Simon... Yeah, thank you. Well, he's as cruel as anything. Yeah. I mean, he... But the people are there, that's the thing. Usually. The people are there. They're sat opposite him and he says horrible things and if they don't like it, well, they can leave or they can smack him one or they can fight back. Which Preston did, of course. <laughs> he, that, out. he did indeed. <laughs> Do you remember Prescott not turning up for John Prescott not turning up? No, it wasn't. It was the other one. It was Roy Hattersley, yes, not turning up for oh, yeah. Have I Got News for You? So oh, they put a tub of lard on lard there, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't care what Hattersley says. That was funny. Just, just very briefly. Go on. Uh, the Rolling Stones in America on the Ed Sullivan show in the 60s had to change the words of their hit song, Let's Spend the Night Together. They yeah, did. They had to sing, Let's Spend Some Time Together. They did indeed. they found it offensive. To they did indeed. The but there, there's a band whose name I've forgotten, and, and they have a song called Don't Marry Her, Marry Me. Don't, don't marry me. That's it. Don't marry her, and the broadcast version is Don't Marry Her But Me. Yeah. That's not Good, the record version. South, isn't it? it is the beautiful South, yeah. Eh? Don't marry her, have me. But yeah. that's not what is, they is say. Is that all it is? Because of the LP version, or whatever you want to call it now, the... the... It's another word entirely. Oh, how often ago that was? <laughs> well, now you know, and I'm not telling you. Have a good day. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> have a time. 0161 228 2255. <laughs> Anyway, it's just gone. No, it's not. It's 18 minutes to 2 o'clock on BBC Radio Manchester. Jonathan Alley's got the headlines. The BBC suspended Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand after the abusive calls made to Andrew Sachs. A driver who knocked down and killed a woman in Bolton nearly three years ago has finally been jailed for six and a half years. And the government's giving more than £100 million of PFI cash to build and refurbish homes in Salford. Manchester's weather, dry and cold with a chance of snow in Pennine areas. Highs of 7 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester 2020 Traffic Still just the outside lane open for traffic on the M60 on approach to Barton Bridge after the accident uh, where a tanker has spilled diesel on the carriageway. A backlog of traffic now uh, past Junction 10 all the way back to uh, Junction 6 at Sale. So some very long delays on the clockwise side of the M60. Other routes not looking too bad at all. Uh, just one or two short delays still on the Metrolink services between Bury and Altering and following a uh, tram breaking down earlier on today. If you spot any other problems, call in on 0161 244 I'm David Powell. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports with Bill Wright. Oldham Athletic are considering a pre-season tour to Israel in the build-up to the 2009-10 season. The tour is expected to be pencilled in for July and it could see Oldham play the likes of Maccabi Haifa and Maccabi Tel Aviv. Striker Luis Alessandra believes he's benefited from playing alongside Lee Hughes for the Latics. The 19-year-old returned to the starting lineup for the first time in six games for last night's game against Scunthorpe, and he promptly scored a hat trick. 
helps me a lot playing with Lee Hughes up front, like little traits as a striker that you want and stuff like. Everyone's telling me, shoot, shoot, be more selfish, be more selfish. Hughes, he says it all the time. Kind of did that to a certain extent. I've done myself no harm with um, the actor. Macclesfield supporters who made the trip to Wickham for last night's game will be able to claim a full refund on their ticket. The game was abandoned after just 22 minutes, so those with a stub are eligible for a refund or entry to the rearranged fixture. The date of that has yet to be confirmed. Mark Hughes says that Manchester City must build on Sunday's win over Stoke when they face Middlesbrough at the Riverside tonight. City lost to Borough 8-1 on the final day of last season, but Hughes knows they're a lot better now than they were then. We're, we're playing OK. What well, we must do uh, is have consistent results and, and back up good performances with, with further good performances. If we do that, then um, we start being talked off in, in good terms and, and people appreciate what we're trying to do here. The latest ex-manager to turn his hand to Premier League management, the latest ex-player rather to turn his hand to Premier League management, pits his wits against Sir Alex Ferguson tonight. Gianfranco Zola has established himself as one of the Premier League's most successful foreign imports in his time as a player at Chelsea. Now can he do the same thing as a manager with West Ham? United's John O'Shea thinks so. I'd like to think he could because of uh, his ideas about football. I think the the type of player he was, he wants to bring that kind of creativity into his teams. And uh, I'm sure the West Ham fans are hoping that too. Bolton take on Everton, hoping for three points to move them out of the relegation zone. Wigan, who are level on points with Bolton, visit the third team on eight points. That's Fulham. And Steve Bruce believes this could be a vital week of football as the Premier League table begins to take shape. I think this is the week 11, 12 games in. You can certainly feel that this is the week of what you're going to do. And uh, it's so tight at the bottom. The bottom ten are, are separated by only a few points. A couple of wins, put back-to-back -back wins together, and you're in the bottom half of the table, you'll get to the top half. So that's what we'll, we'll be looking forward to do if we can. Um, but it's frankly very, very difficult to do that, as we all know. Tony Adams has his first taste of Premier League management with Portsmouth going to Anfield to face the leaders Liverpool. Tottenham's new boss Harry Redknapp has an equally hard task with a trip to Arsenal. A win for Spurs could take them off the bottom of the table. Diego Maradona is to return to football as the national coach of Argentina. One of the game's all-time greats will be confirmed in the role next Tuesday, according to their FA, and he'll attend the friendly against Scotland at Hampden Park next month. Wigan Warriors George Carmont and Harrison Hansen have been named in the Samoa team to face Tonga on Friday at the Rugby League World Cup. St Helens three-quarters Francis Melly and Willie Talau are also in the 13. India have closed the final day of the third test against Australia on a commanding 296 for three. They lead the four-match series 1-0. Andy Murray begins his quest to become the first man ever to win three Masters Series titles in a row today. He plays Sam Kerry in Paris tonight. And doctors say that Seve Ballesteros' condition has improved. That's following a third operation on his brain tumour. The next live action on the North West's biggest sports station. Can Manchester City avenge that 8-1 thrashing they got from Middlesbrough last season? You can hear full match commentary from the Riverside tonight, plus all the action from United, Bolton and Wigan in the all-new Manchester Sports from 7. BBC Radio Manchester. How are you doing? You all right? Good old. Good old. Yes. Interesting. Hasn't it, though? Deary, deary me. How could one little out of hand gag get all this fuss. Alan, you didn't have to do a course for being offensive. <laughs> no, no, you missed it. <laughs> Jenny Middleton. No, 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 I wasn't on the course to learn how to be offensive. I was on the course as as a participant to to defend offensiveness. Derek and Lee, so all's well with the world. The rich comedian's been gagged for his off-colour gag and the Wigginers dining on his meat and potato pie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, 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 that's quite cruel. This type of personal attack on an individual is typical of the... My apologies. Typical of the hypocrisy of modern trendy comedians who refuse to tell gro jokes about groups, races, but will happily insult an individual. 
These people look down on their noses at the likes of Burnham Manning, Chubby Brown, etc., when, in my opinion, they're no better. Surely, common sense suggests that it's better to insult a group, safety in numbers, than target one person. The worst hypocrisy I ever saw was Ben Elton, the epitome of PC comedy. You refuse to condemn Monty Python for being racist and sexist when they sometimes were because of his because it because in his words they did their thing and then that was it that was what they did and they did it in the 70s isn't that what they said about the black and white minstrel show well yes they never i think i think ben elton I, I wouldn't want to put words in his mouth but i suspect he'd say the same about the black and white minstrel show humor humor has to be viewed in the mores of the day if we look back at some of the humor that went on in the 50s and 60s it would be utterly unacceptable now that that doesn't mean it was wrong to do it then it was wrong for it to be done but the individual doing it no ross's viewing figures are so high they won't sack him they can't sack him one well they can't sack one without the other so neither will get sacked so says mark the bus driver one thing you learn in this business, Mark, is that it doesn't matter how high your figures are, how many people are listening to you or watching you, you're still part of the BBC. And frankly, no one is bigger than it, and that includes the cleaner and the director general. No one is bigger than this organisation. No one, I promise you. If I was sacked tomorrow, you would have forgotten I existed by Monday and that is exactly how it should be. Colin, also in Bolton. Relating to the question, is it ever acceptable for radio pre presenters to offend? I've noticed that some callers to your programme attempt to override your rational arguments with arrogance, aggression and conceit when they have no logical contention to offer. Perhaps you are justified in such circumstances in calling them a complete and utter prat. All right, well, I, do, I wouldn't want you as my lawyer, but thank you for the defence anyway. Tony in Ramsbottom, hiya, Tony. Hiya, Alan. What for um, Well, I was just saying to Justin, I've forgotten how many times you've insulted me on the air talking uh, different things, but I'm still here listening. I you mean, are indeed, <laughs> <laughs> and we're grateful for it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, you learn something all the time when you're talking to you. But um, I teach kids rugby, um, and I have done from being, like, eight-year-olds, under eights, and I've now got a squad of 23, 16, 17-year-olds. We go right the way through. Um, but my point is, um, Jonathan and what's his name? I forgot his, his name now. Um, Russell. There's, there's a, a scheme of things here. There's a little point system, and they've, got, they've just stepped a little bit too far over to one side. Don't you agree? Um They've certainly stepped too far. I don't know how small the step is, but if you employ people to push the boundaries, we can discuss whether you should, but if you employ people to push the boundaries, then they are sometimes going to push a little bit harder than you thought they would. Yeah, I mean, my lads watch John, uh, Jonathan Ross's show sometimes with me. I mean, mm. more than 16 now, you know. And uh, I do enjoy it. Uh, one of your previous callers said he has quality guests on, and, you know, he can get them to go just that little bit further... And that celebrity in it, and so, you know, seeing how they deal with it and mm. making them uncomfortable is at times funny. But I think what they've forgotten is um, the point I was making about a little step. Some people look at that and think, well, it's acceptable to take the Mickey out of people. Um, I'll just, and then they start to take the Mickey, but then they'll pick the wrong person. One poor, unfortunate individual who has had a really bad day, a really bad time, and all this lot, and they can take it. Absolutely, you know, child line is a case in point, mm. bullying. Yeah. Um, I mean, just text message. I've seen it with my kids um, through school, through mobile phones. The, you know, all they need is a little push to say, that's acceptable, I can take the mickey. And uh, then it gets a little bit further out of hand, a little bit more out of hand, and then somebody is really, really, you know, feeling bad. Um, and... What they should be d doing, it shouldn't sack them, is make them go and work uh, in, in a London somewhere, in a youth opportunity type thing, mm. you know, with them. Stick them with them for about three or four weeks. And I don't mean standing there with the cameras on them. Leave them. I and mean, uh, I know it'd make the pair of them uncomfortable because they're both a pair of fops. So um, stick them with them and let's 
see what they think. I bet they won't, they're not taking the mickey out of people after that. Well, indeed, that would be it. It's a shame we haven't got the mines open, isn't it? Put a couple of days down the mine, although the, the, the humour down there, I'm told, could be somewhat ribald. But it I wouldn't was... put those two in mine. Uh, I respect mine is far too much. <laughs> what a great answer. <laughs> good on you, Tony. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Cheers, mate. Have a good day. 0161 228 Just uh, a piece of information that you may or may not find interesting. We've talked about the legality of what these two people have done and Andrew Sachs and the like, and we discussed whether he'd reported or indeed whether he would report the matter to the police. I've just had a message up on my news wire gazooby thing saying, quote, Mr Sachs, Andrew Sachs that is, Mr Sachs has said he will not be reporting the matter to the police, adding, I'm not going to take it anywhere. I'm not out for revenge. I think I said earlier that I, I'm aware that the man is a gentleman, and... That may well be the gentlemanly way of dealing with it from his point of view. One thing I can tell you without fear of contradiction is that Andrew Sachs comes out of this sounding like a fantastic bloke. Dear Alan, will all these sad, sad people who are wittering on about these two nomarchs please go out and get a life? Thank you. From UMT. I don't know what UMT stands for, unless it's a kind of long-lasting milk. I suspect it's not. Andy Crane, live at the Lowry. I put my money in the bank because that's how I get paid. I've got to put my cheque. You know, I can't spend a cheque. It's got to go in the bank. And then suddenly the bank goes bust and you might lose everything. Yeah? Unfortunately, I haven't got that much to worry about. No, neither have I. Music, politics and comedy. Kind of wonder, don't you, say, no. well, where did the money go? Three weeks ago it was worth this. Now it's not. I thought a pound was backed by a pound's worth of gold held by the Bank of England. Yeah. And that's all gone, apparently. Remember the that? days. You know that three-gallon whiskey bottle you've got full of coins? That's the one. That's safe. Yeah. I'll stick hold with that. Your Sunday lunchtime Live at the Lowry with Andy Crane. Lots to talk about, uh, serious and uh, and light-hearted. Sunday from noon, BBC Radio Manchester. It's all going awfully well, isn't it? Yes. If you're in town in the next few days and you cast your eyes upwards, I mean not to heaven, that would be, well, for you to do if you so wish but if you cast your eyes upwards you may see the big screen on the side of what we are now required to call the triangle I'm still not comfortable with it but thereupon in the reasonably yeah just from Saturday so starting on Saturday on the big screen hanging on the side of the triangle there's going to be film from the Imperial War Museum of the North as our Mistis Day and Poppy Day approaches. So there'll be uh, archive footage of the First World War. Lancashire Fusiliers move up to the front line and soldiers of the Manchester Regiment in captured German trenches. So that's from the Battle of the Somme. There'll also be, I mean, this will be on a revolving loop, I presume. It's all part of what the BBC provide you. It's not just two offensive no marks, or even three if you include me. Um, trench food, soldiers cooking and eating to fight off the winter cold. We may learn something from that. And home, women and the war, the day in the life of a munitions worker at work, playing football at South End, and also the celebrations in London and Dublin and the unknown warrior procession to Westminster Abbey on the 11th of November, 1920. That, that's a 45-minute film that will will sort of run round. So if you, if you get the chance and you're in town and it's warm enough, you might sit and watch that happening. Just reminding us all of the whole idea of why we buy a poppy. Well, I say we, not everybody does, and why should they? If you're in Blackpool and you're thinking you might buy a poppy, then go and see me dad. He's selling poppies in Marks and Spencers. He always gets the good gaff. He's not daft. Unlike his son, who's barmy, but certainly go and buy a poppy, buy a poppy somewhere if you're that way inclined. It's not compulsory. It's a matter of choice. And I know there are an awful lot of people who say, why should we? And I agree with you, why should we? For two reasons. One, you could see it as encouraging war. Two, you could see it as letting the government off the hook, who very definitely have the responsibility to look after soldiers and their families, even after their fighters. But frankly, the government doesn't do it, because the government, since the First World War in this country, in this matter, has stank and continues to stink. 
and they leave it to the likes of you and me. But if you and me don't do it, the government aren't going to pick up the bill. It's going to be you and me. So if you buy a poppy, it doesn't go... Just for the record, the money from the poppy doesn't go to run the legion clubs. You know, like nearly every town's got a legion. None of that money from the poppy goes to run the club. They have to run themselves. They have to, to run themselves as a, as a business, if you like. A load of volunteers involved, but they have to run themselves as a business. So none of the money from the poppy goes to that. That all goes to the work that the Legion do, the, fo the, the Foreign Legion, I nearly said, the British Legion, entirely different, ha, 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 but the, the British Legion, and that goes to help the, the social work of the Legion, that's what it's all for. Anyway, there you are, that's it from me. If you're going to complain, then frankly, to get heard, you're going to have to get at least 18,000 of you, so get some pals together if you're going to complain about me, otherwise, who okay. cares? <laughs> See you tomorrow. He made it to the final few. And now he makes it to BBC Radio Manchester.